restaurants and romance, empire and opera, fun surprising experiences at every one of the more than 300 stops on the metro. My name is Lisa. I'm a writer and tour guide. I carry a Canadian passport, but all we'll need is a ticket for the metro system as I show you historic, inspirational, endlessly fabulous Paris. I'd like to share my love for this spectacular city with you, one stop after the next, by way of the exciting Paris metro system. So grab your French phrase book and put on your walking shoes. We're going to Paris. historic, romantic Paris. Today, we're strolling along the boulevards around the Grand Boulevard metro stop. We'll be popping into passageways that feel just like the 19th century. The arcades off the boulevards were the first shopping centers of France. Let's check in on some celebrities, discover the fabulous Passage, historic theaters, and even a museum dedicated to a mysterious secret society. This is Grand Boulevard. These boulevards were created when Louis XIV, the Sun King, decided to tear down the ramparts that surrounded the city of Paris. He therefore created the first wide open boulevards where Parisians have loved to walk up and down ever since. Now the boulevards were exciting from the get-go because they were a place where people of all classes could walk around and see and be seen. The busy Grand Boulevard of Paris are as crucial to our image of the city as the Eiffel Tower. Millions of cars and pedestrians travel through these boulevards every day. They're part of Parisian life. The Grand Boulevard is a neighborhood where people work, shop, and most importantly, come to be entertained in the many restaurants, theaters, and cinemas. 19th century urban planner Baron Haussmann gave the city the look it has today. His vision expanded Paris into a modern city and enlarged the sidewalks to attract crowds. He also installed street furniture, elements that are part of the visual identity of the city, such as newsstands and Morris columns. Keep an eye on your map when you're in Paris, especially if you're traveling by car. Unlike North American streets that may have the same name for several kilometers, Parisian boulevards can change name every few hundred meters. The Great Boulevards are really 11 right bank streets tracing a wide arc between Bastille in the east and Place de la Madeleine in the west. Our metro stop Grand Boulevard is right in the middle of this arc. Now today we're going to explore this area, but first we're going to deke off the noise of the boulevard and we're going to go inside one of my favorite covered passageways. Here we find several arcades or passages, which are a legacy of the 19th century. These covered arcades were built to allow pedestrians to get away from the weather and enjoy cozy shops, glamorous restaurants, and theaters. Passage Jouffroy allows you to walk from Boulevard Montmartre to Rue de la Grange Batelière. And a stroll down this arcade is almost like going back in time in a setting that has hardly changed since 1846, the year of its inauguration. Back then, the Passage was a true symbol of modernism and comfort, featuring the latest in gas lighting and pretty tiled floors. This is an ideal place to find a rare book in a bookshop or an unusual antique. Along with toy stores, specialty shops, and souvenir stores, there are hair salons, art galleries, and even a hotel, the Chopin. Restaurants abound in all of the arcades, so let's take a stop into one of my favorite traditional tea rooms. This is Le Valentin. Bonjour. Madame. Ah, oui, je vais prendre un thé. Bonjour. Bonjour, monsieur. Et une pâtisserie. Ça sera sur place, madame. Along with its warm retro atmosphere, Valentin's menu offers a fantastic range of classic pastries. While these individual Black Forest or Mont Blanc look familiar, Valentin also features pastries from Lorraine, a province in eastern France. If you happen to stay at the Hotel Chopin in this passage, you can pop in here for one of Valentin's special fruit brioche. 
Oh, they have a great selection of teas. They've got green sencha tea with blood orange. They've got Russian tea, which I love. And they've got Jardin Bleu, which has rhubarb and wild strawberries in it. That one might be too weird for me. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have the Russian tea. Can't wait. What's wonderful about Le Valentin is not only does it have some of my favorite pastries in all of Paris, but it's really historic to have tea and pastries here in one of the arcades of the city because the passage near the Grand Boulevard were really the first place ladies could go unaccompanied to have tea and lunch by themselves. There had been taverns in the past, but ladies did not go to taverns. And there had been restaurants as of the middle of the 1700s, but even then, ladies could only go there if they were accompanied by family or husbands or male friends. These tea rooms were the first place that we could go and just be by ourselves. Women could go shopping, women could have tea and lunch in these wonderful historic tea rooms. Let's continue our tour of the Passage Jouffroy to a fabulous toy store just opposite the Valentin Tea Room. Welcome to Pain des Fils, a paradise for children and for those who are still kids at heart. Yes, everybody needs a mask. What do you think, is it me? Actually, the shop specializes in amazing things, not just paper masks. This toy shop has been here for 40 years, and it specializes in all kinds of old-fashioned toys, the kind that don't need batteries, like teddy bears and dolls and doll clothes, and wonderful flying toys that flap, like this one. And dollhouses. They have the most amazing miniatures for dollhouses, things I wouldn't even imagine a dollhouse would need, like a miniature penguin or the tiniest alligator anyone has ever seen. Every dollhouse needs some mice as well, so this place, because it has everything for the well-appointed dollhouse, has miniature mice and some cheese in case the mouse gets hungry in your dollhouse. This is the dream shop for dollhouse enthusiasts of all ages. There's everything to make your small-scale world as realistic as possible. These lamps actually light up in your dollhouse. You can plug them in and a little tiny Christmas light comes on to make it look like your doll has a Tiffany lamp in her living room. I can't believe these exist. And of course, we can't have a toy store without stuffed animals. The traditional bears are wonderful because they do bears here that actually are soft and jointed and weighted so they sit properly. They don't fall over like those cheap, not nice teddy bears. These ones are lovely. The hedgehog kind of has my hairdo. That's probably uh, why I feel sympathetic towards the hedgehog. He's so cute. What I really need to do in here is look for some gifts for my niece. Actually, the origami might be just what she wants, something crafty, something you can do yourself, not too old. I mean, she's five after all. So let's see where that one is, yes. Okay, initiation to origami, we're set. So I'm gonna get this and go downstairs. So whatever the age of the person you're shopping for, Pain des Pices is the perfect two-floor emporium for every toy you can imagine. Merci beaucoup. The Grand Boulevard is a part of Paris with special discoveries around every corner and down every passage. We'll visit a unique art gallery right after this. in rushing, thrilling Paris on one of the busy Grand Boulevard. Here it's noisy and the cars never stop. But to escape from the crowds, we just step into one of the many passages in the neighborhood around the Grand Boulevard Metro. 
There are wonderful art galleries here amongst the shops. In the Passage Jouffroy, the Verdot Gallery specializes in old photographs and rare footage for collectors. It offers more than 20,000 photographs from 1850 to 1970. Lovers of vintage shots will find unusual formats, like these coal prints by photographer Adolph Brown, dating from 1875. The technology available at the time was cumbersome, and he had to use a device almost as big as the size of the photo. The gallery is a real window into history, like these pictures of the Great Flood of Paris from 1910. The gallery certifies the authenticity of each photo. Just look at the back, like here with this photo by famous Parisian photographer Robert Doineau. It's a chansonnier. And again, it's got his stamp on it, which is pretty cool. This is his address. While the gallery is specialized in vintage and collection photos, it also presents the work of contemporary photographers. And each new exhibition here starts with a launch where you can actually meet today's photographers. Some prints are worth a small fortune, but if you have a limited budget, you can find a worthwhile souvenir for just a euro by sifting through the bulk cases. Here, there's beautiful landscapes, mysterious portraits, and traditional French family shots. For armchair travelers, if you don't have a chance to visit the French capital, you can peruse over 6,000 photos on Verdot's website. Let's continue to discover the area with the Passage Verdot, which extends the Jouffroy Passage. They were built at almost the same period and share a similar style of neoclassical architecture. The Passage Verdot is from 1847, which is a really exciting time to be in the covered arcades of Paris because the streets outside are horrible. You have to imagine streets in this city where the cemeteries, the slaughterhouses, even the sewers emptied into the middle of the streets. So the mud was abominable, especially when it rained. So if you wanted to do something elegant, maybe meet a friend for a drink, have a coffee, you came to the arcades where the floor was marble, there was wonderful gas lighting, very modern for the 1800s. And you could also browse. You could buy yourself gloves, maybe some other accessories, and you could look at books. So it was a beautiful place to go shopping. These passages are also interesting architecturally because not only is there beautiful marble and the lovely facades, but the roofs are built very much like the train stations which were being built in the 1830s and 40s. Glass roofs, big panes to let in the light supported by metal. These passages were originally all over Paris. There were over 200 of them. Now only a few remain, but really they were the original shopping malls of Paris. Leaving the Passage Verdot for the Rue du Faubourg Montmartre, we're still embraced by the past. This shop, à la mère de famille, dates back to 1761, and it's a classified historical monument. This facade, which has not changed since the 19th century, sets the tone advertising confectionery, desserts, and chocolate. You're entering the temple of sweets, gingerbread, cookies, candied fruit, and all forms of chocolate. If you love sugar, this is a must stop for you. The quality of the treats made on site here is appreciated by both locals and by visitors who come from all over the world. This is a great opportunity to discover French gourmet specialties such as candied chestnuts, nougat, and calisson, a ground almond and fruit treat. A la mère de famille doesn't just sell chocolate. Here they have an artisanal workshop that creates chocolate in all its forms with different products depending on the time of year. Over the past decade, A la Mère de Famille has opened other shops in Paris. But this is the original with its superb historic facade on the Rue du Faubourg Montmartre.
After this sweet temple, we'll delve into a more mysterious kind of temple in the French capital. We'll discover an organization rife with secrets right after this. We're in mysterious, intriguing Paris. This is not just the city of light, it's also a city of secrets. After the hidden 19th century atmosphere of the arcades, let's go up narrow Rue Cadet to step into a secret society. The Grand Orient is the oldest and most important Masonic Brotherhood in all of Europe. And in this rather weird silvery building behind me on the Market Street Rue Cadet, you can go into the museum and check out all the information about the rituals and symbols of the Brotherhood. It's even stranger than a Dan Brown novel. Well, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code brought us into the world of American Freemasons, this museum presents the European origins of the sometimes maligned organization. It's located in this building of the Grand Orient of France, which is simply the collection of all the Freemason lodges in this country. Modern Freemasonry is the product of the Enlightenment. It began in Scotland in the early 18th century and gradually spread throughout Europe and North America. Masons are people who have decided to come together in a sort of philanthropic social club whose philosophy works towards the progress of humanity. Tolerance is a fundamental principle. This is an organization which defines itself as a fraternal humanist society that ignores the religion of its members. It welcomes all Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, and Muslim. At the beginning of its operations in France, Freemasonry was banned and condemned by the Pope. Because of the adversarial nature of the French, these prohibitions attracted many members into its ranks. Freemasonry is the transformation of workers, the Masons, into an association of thinkers. From its beginnings as working Masons, it has preserved its compass and square, which are the most famous symbols. The compass represents discernment, the square, integrity. Another element of the Masons' Guild is the apron worn by the members at their meetings. This workwear is now adorned with various symbols that represent the lodge to which they belong. Traditionally, each meeting is followed by a feast during which members continue to discuss their ideas. The museum has an interesting collection of dishes decorated with Freemason symbols. An earthenware dish of superb quality, which dates from the 19th century, still looks new today. The large building, Grand Orient of France, has several Masonic temples that are used throughout the year. These venues all have the same configuration. The chair of the Venerable Master is always positioned to the east and is surrounded by experienced members. Younger and less experienced members sit around the room. While the configuration is identical for all the temples of the Freemasons, the decor varies in each one. If Freemasonry intrigues you with its aura of mystery that surrounds it, I recommend this museum on the Rue Cadet. You may not learn any incredible secrets, but you'll find out some truth behind the enigmatic temple, and you'll discover the amazing influence the Freemasons have had on the history of France. Just a block away is the Drouot district, where antiques and art galleries, stamp specialists, and coin sellers fill the small streets around the prestigious Drouot auction house. Welcome to Drouot, one of the oldest auction houses in the world, here just off the Grand Boulevard, in a modern building that houses 21 different auction rooms, all selling different kinds of art. All the catalogs for the upcoming sales are displayed here in the entranceway. Why don't we go off to room 8 and check out some art? works of art, furniture, and objects that are auctioned are exposed to the public before the sale. It's important to look at the art up close, because often there are remarkable differences when compared with the picture in the catalog. The indigos and everything are just much darker and have none of the personality. There's no way to compare seeing this art in the flesh or real. 
and there's a big collection that's being sold here. They announce it in the press, they make a big deal of it, and you know, that's why I've been to the Drool before, is just to look at some of the collections. I mean, they occasionally have sold off phenomenal art collections that used to be owned by Yves Saint Laurent or great surrealist artists, and you can come here and see things that are otherwise going to disappear into private collections. You may never see them in a museum, so it's, it's really a personal way to get to know the art world and learn about what's out there. It's just it's such a treat to be here. Rule has 21 rooms, so there's something for everybody. And everything is exposed at 11 a.m. in the morning, and then it goes on sale at 2.30. So I'm going to check out the next room, not just modern art, but maybe something a little pinker, a lot pinker, actually. All kinds of furniture and art objects. And I didn't realize you could even sit on some of the things that are being presented. That's great. Everybody needs an emperor in their house. How much is the emperor? The emperor is starting price of 120,000 euros. A very valuable clock. They're expecting it to go for about 300,000 euros. It's interesting that the gold looks so different in real life. The color of it just popping out against the pink. The auctioneer actually chooses the environment the art is displayed in. So the auctioneer can choose any color he or she wants that will make the art really pop out and grab people. And the pink works. You wouldn't have thought it, but the pink works. Promptly at 2.30, the auction begins. The auction house Drouot attracts collectors with very different budgets. Prices start at 10 euros and can reach several million. If you've already attended an auction in North America, you'll notice immediately that here the atmosphere is very different. No comments, no encouragement to buy. This is a refined auctioneering style. The price is announced calmly, awarded to the winner, and then we move on to the next item. Maître Pierre Blanchet, an auctioneer for over 15 years, has learned to identify different kinds of buyer behavior. So now I'm used to this work, so I know how to recognize uh, people uh, who are interested. You see some people who begin to be anxious, and uh, you see a lot, uh, number 12 is coming, and you see a, a man or woman who is being anxious, who is beginning to move. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, body so you language, get good yes. at reading that yes. as well. But not all the buyers are in the room. Many people bid on phone because many, almost for uh, art dealers, professional art dealers, who prefer to be on phone because they don't want people to see them uh, buying uh, paintings. This one was really exciting. It's a bronze head by Camille Claudel, and they had estimated it between 4,000 and 5,000 euros, and it actually went for over 8,000. And there was this bidding war from someone on the telephone, a secret bidder, and somebody in the room. So it was really fun to watch. I'm so glad we came. These secret bidders now have an even more private choice. They can participate in the auction via internet. Drouot installs a camera in the auction house so buyers can bid from home. Drouot currently generates more than 20% of its sales through the internet. That means that even if you don't have the chance to travel to Paris, you can still participate. Imagine you can skip jet lag and start your day off by bidding on this beautiful gold clock, perfect for your living room. Next, let's enjoy a glass of good wine in a hip new restaurant that's moved into one of the old arcades off the Grand Boulevard right after this. We're in bustling, exciting Paris, exploring the neighborhood around the Grand Boulevard metro stop. The covered arcades are the major attraction of this area. We've already checked out the Jouffroy and Verdot passage, and now we'll visit one that's even older. 
this is the Passage des Panorama. It was opened in 1799. It was actually designed with two giant rotundas with panoramic paintings where you went up a staircase and got this sort of cinemascopic effect of paintings that were either historical or biblical. Even though the towers with their painted cinematic murals were torn down in 1831, the Passage des Panorama is as popular as ever. The Grand Boulevard neighborhood has been a mecca of entertainment in Paris for over 200 years. And after seeing a show, Parisians have always gone out to eat. Here in the arcades, you can actually eat outside no matter what the weather. Now, the original Passage des Panorama had facades like this one, like the Arba Canal, carefully carved facades of tea rooms. Alongside its lovely restaurants, the Passage des Panorama has several shops that will delight collectors. Antique lovers can spend hours browsing the coins, stamps, and engravings. The magnificent antique signs add to the retro atmosphere. Now I'm going to take you to my favorite wine bar in the Passage des Panorama. Here's Cuinsto Vino, located on a corner of the arcade. That's why the restaurant is called Cuinsto, French slang meaning corner. The Cuinsto Vino updates the tradition of small French bistros, serving seasonal organic cuisine with a relaxed, friendly vibe. Here you won't spend hours choosing what you want to eat, because there's only two options on the menu, and they change every day. What's great about Cuinsto Vino here in the Passage des Panorama is that at lunchtime, which is really the time to come to the Passage, they have a wonderful deal on their full meal. So for 17 euros or something thereabouts, you get three courses. You get a starter, you get a really healthy, organic, or at least farm fresh meal of the day in season, and you get a dessert and you get their advice on wine, which is fabulous. The young owners are passionate about their cozy bistro and they're on a mission to introduce smaller vineyards wines to Parisian diners. The owners know everything about the bottles in their wine cave and they're on first name basis with the winemakers who produce it. Merci. This looks great. What's nice about Cuesto Vino is that it's this corner place, very cozy, really committed to the idea of local, traditional, bistro-type meals, not a huge selection, very much seasonal, and the wines really echo that. You can actually come in here and buy a bottle of wine anytime after 9 in the morning. They're open straight through till 4 if you're going to buy a bottle of wine to take away. For lunch, it's much more specific. It's noon till 2, and that's your time to have lunch because they really have such a limited menu. But the wines are fabulous because the people who select the wines here are really committed to organic and natural and not fussy and not chemically affected wines at all. So they're really natural and quite delicious, I have to say. And also the Passage are a lovely place to have lunch. This place is a little less known by passers through Paris, but it's really popular with the locals. Now that we've had such a good lunch, let's walk over to a major tourist attraction in the French capital, somewhere we can do some celebrity spotting. This is the Musée Gravin, which is a wax museum which opened in 1882, at a time when most newspapers weren't publishing photographs. So if you wanted to see the celebrities and the events of the news, you came here to see them recreated in wax. This Greve Museum is the brainchild of Arthur Mayer, journalist and founder of the Gaulois newspaper. To create wax sculptures depicting newsworthy events, Mayer called on Alfred Grevin, a cartoonist, designer of theatrical costumes, and a sculptor. Gravin produced the wax sculptures for this museum that would eventually carry his name. The Gravin today is a great gathering of the world's best personalities, but the museum is also a good opportunity to learn more about the history of France, since some of the most famous figures in the country are represented. 
Here Louis XIV is surrounded by his court, and in the next rooms there's film actor Gérard Depardieu, writer Jean-Paul Sartre, singers Henri Salvador and Johnny Halliday, and rugby player Sébastien Chabal. Originally, the Grévin Museum only presented French personalities, but soon the directors realized that adding international celebrities would pull in more visitors. We have uh, very proud uh, to present, uh, for example, Mr. Nicolas Cage, Penelope Cruz, Brad Pitt, George Clooney, Liza Minnelli, Charles Bronson, Clint Eastwood. So it is not only French works figure. Um, it's a very important gallery of uh, the history of the world. To qualify as a wax figure for the museum, you have to be very well known. That's it. Fame is the only selection criteria. We follow the actuality. So uh, you have just to read the newspaper every day and to see who is the most important in this newspaper. And uh, after we, we have to choose. The museum has its own Grévin Academy, which chooses the people who will be immortalized. It's composed of journalists and directed by Bernard Pivot, a French television celebrity who, of course, has his own effigy properly installed on a chair in the museum. Each year, they welcome four to six new wax statues, but of course, they have to remove the same number. It's not easy to decide who should retire, but if you're not in the news anymore, you're probably headed into storage. The unveiling of a new statue is usually in the presence of its living model, and the biggest stars, such as Michael Jackson, have always been more than happy to attend the ceremony. It was a very important moment of the Grévin history, uh, because Michael Jackson was very, very enjoy to be in Grévin Museum, very proud of that. And uh, we, we met him a few times, and uh, it was a a beautiful present for Grévin Museum. The Grévin Museum includes gorgeous interiors for its famous statues, from an original 19th century theater with beautifully ornate ceiling to a complete hall of mirrors originally built for the Universal Exhibition of 1900. This gives the wax statues an environment as luxurious as the one which their real-life counterparts enjoy. But the current celebrities here are much easier to get close to. Have you ever wanted to be photographed beside Brad Pitt or Madonna? The Gravel Museum may be the only place in the world where you'll get your wish. And after seeing these wax film stars, maybe you're in the mood to see a movie. One of the most beautiful theaters in Paris is on the Grand Boulevard. We'll visit this Art Deco cinema right after this. We're in entertaining, theatrical Paris on the Grand Boulevard. This is one of the main nightlife areas in the French capital. The boulevards are lined with cinemas, concert halls, and especially theaters. This is the Théâtre des Variétés. It was opened in 1807, initially as a vaudeville hall connected to the Passage des Panoramas. Later, it became known for Music Hall under Maurice Chevalier. And then until 2005, it was under the direction of movie star Jean-Paul Belmondo. Now, different kinds of shows have played here, like the Casual Folle or plays by Sacha Guitry. And even today, you can come here to see great French comedies, big boulevard-style plays. This Théâtre de Boulevard tradition came out of the classical theater of the 1700s. Formal theater was considered too serious and reserved for the upper classes of society, whereas the boulevards were for entertainment for everyone. There are all kinds of theaters along these wide boulevards. Even if you don't speak French or you don't have time to attend a show, it's worth strolling along to enjoy the architecture. On Boulevard Saint-Martin, the Théâtre de la Renaissance is a superb example of the Italian theatrical style. In a style similar to that of the Paris Opera, it fits perfectly into the landscape of the boulevards, created by Baron Haussmann in the 19th century. steps from the Théâtre de la Renaissance is Porte Saint-Martin Theatre. It was completely destroyed by fire during riots in the Paris Commune in 1871, but it was quickly rebuilt to great success. Plays like Les Misérables and the famous Cyrano de Bergerac have been performed here, and the great actress Sarah Bernhardt trod across this stage often. 
The boulevards don't just feature theaters. There are also cinemas like the Max Linder Panorama on the Boulevard Poissonniere, or its huge, famous neighbor a little more to the east. Le Grand Rex Cinema opened in 1932 with the film Les Trois Mousquetaires. It's a fabulous art deco movie house with the original gigantic viewing room that seats 2,750 people. It's often used for French movie premieres. Now you can also visit a bit of the behind the scenes of an old school movie theater by going to see Les Etoiles du Rex. The entrance for that is just beside the ticket buying entrance. The Rex has one of the most mythical screening rooms in Paris. The City of Light is a cinephile's dream. Every year, dozens of films are shot here, and the Parisian public is fond of the big screen. So it makes sense to find the largest cinema in all of Europe here. Inspired by Radio City Music Hall in New York, the Grand Rex premiered to scandal at the time of its opening due to its Art Deco architecture, which is a strange fit with the houseman style of the Parisian boulevards. The Grand Rex was the dream of Jacques Haïk, a rich film producer and distributor. In the early 30s, he decided to build this extravagant movie theater steeped in Mediterranean decor with the hopes of offering moviegoers an unforgettable experience. Here, everything is set to ensure that spectators enjoy the experience down to the last detail, genuine leather chairs. The ceiling is inlaid with dark blue stars, which give the impression of watching a film outside during a beautiful summer night. Watching a film here is like walking into an enchanted Mediterranean fairy tale. Of all the cinemas of this style, built between 1920 and 1940 that are still active, the Grand Rex is the largest. The Grand Rex has always been on the cutting edge of technology. For example, when it opened, its ventilation system renewed the air 50 times per day, which was revolutionary for the time. In 1957, Gary Cooper and French actress Mylène de Monjou inaugurated the escalator of the Great Hall, another first for a theater. Projection equipment is updated whenever a new technology is available, and with its 300 square meter space, the movie screen is the largest in Europe. It's time for a backstage tour, an interactive peek behind the scenes of the Grand Rex. This is a perfect treat for film buffs because we get to see some aspects of filmmaking. The guide is unique. She's a cartoon character. Her name's Manisa, and she'll introduce you to all the secrets of this legendary theater. You can visit the screening room, director's office, and behind the scenes of the big screen. Visitors can participate in various stages of film production, like shooting a scene aboard a boat in a storm. Thanks to the magic of a green screen, moving floor, and a large fan, the illusion is pretty convincing. Au suivant, ça va être à vous. In the post-production studio, visitors get to try voiceover, where it becomes clear that it's not easy to deliver lines precisely in sync with the image. Each step of the tour is filmed, and the images are immediately integrated into a montage of excerpts from famous films, so that participants have the impression of sharing the stage with the biggest film stars. For those who aren't familiar with the business of the seventh art, this is a great discovery full of surprises, a real peek into the world of cinema that's brought untold happiness to Parisians since the 1930s. From the Grand Rex, let's take a little walk down the Boulevard Bonne Nouvelle to a very specially appetizing museum. This is the Musée Gourmand du Chocolat, otherwise known as 
Choco Story, which opened in 2010 as the city's first museum of chocolate. If you go here, you get an entire history of the delectable treat, and right at the end, you get to taste some delicious chocolate. Choco Story starts the chocolate saga 4,000 years ago in South America. In Mayan and Aztec civilizations, cocoa was so precious that its beans were used as currency. It was consumed as a drink called the divine nectar. According to the legend, the god Quetzalcoatl was the great master of cocoa. The god taught man how to grow and prepare the chocot, which was the ancestor of our chocolate. When the Spaniards landed in South America in the 16th century, they discovered cocoa. They added sugar to mitigate the bitterness. From 1527, Cortes began importing the precious cocoa beans to Spain. Chocolate quickly became the favorite drink of the Spanish court, soon spreading to other royal families of Europe. By the mid-1800s, tea and chocolate emerged as popular drinks. Chocolate was also used in medicine to soften the bitter taste of drugs and in cooking to enhance the flavor of food. In the 19th century, production diversified and chocolate appeared in all kinds of forms, liquid, solid, sticks and bars. Chefs delighted in chocolate's magical property, that it can be melted and molded into every shape imaginable, well beyond the Easter Bunny. The museum does not just feature chocolate, it also shows you how to make it. Perfect for chocoholics, the chocolate shop offers activities for young and old, instructing you on how to prepare all the different types of chocolate. In France, there's a saying that everything ends with a song. On the Grand Boulevard, we're going to wrap up our day at a traditional boulevardier bistro chantant with a song right after this. We're in beautiful, inspiring Paris. We're at Grand Boulevard Metro. Let's check out a special tradition of the neighborhood, something a little different by way of Parisian nightlife. This is the Limonaire, which has been here for over 15 years as a bistro chantant, where you can come and hear music, part of the big tradition of Paris chansonniers, here tucked in this really cute alley behind the Grand Boulevard. You can have something to drink, you can have something to eat, and tonight we're gonna hear Gérard Morel. So I have a millefeuille made of beetroot, which is pretty unusual and quite cool as a starter. I actually really like beetroot. The nice thing about the Limonaire is that it's a restaurant where you can meet your friends for a drink and a bite to eat, but really at 10 o'clock the serious stuff begins because the food service dwindles down and people start paying attention to the music, the main event at Limonaire. Because like the old tradition of French chanson bars at the edge of the city, here at the Limonaire every single night of the week there's a musician singing either traditional French chanson or somebody singing their own contemporary takes on the idea of the chansonnier profession. Nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir ce soir Gérard Morel, donc on est très content. The barman just announced the singer is going to start and reminded you to order more drinks now, to finish your food, and he says if your cell phone goes off while Gérard is singing, you're going to have to buy a round of drinks for the entire restaurant. Fortunately, I've already ordered my drink and I've turned off my cell phone, so I can sit back and enjoy this actually very rare experience experience in Paris where you have the old school chansonnier evening. Even if you don't speak French, don't let that keep you away. This place is a classic. The food's good, the atmosphere is friendly, and the wine flows freely. <laughs> Tonight's performer, Gérard Morel, sings songs full of humor. He connects with the audience from the very first note. Ah, 
C'est le tango de la lombalgie vulgo. C'est le tango du lumbago. Once the show has ended, the limonaire bartender reminds us that even if the entry is free, the exit is full price. Come on, let's relive the old tradition of passing the hat to pay the singer. Most people consider the performance is worth at least as much as a movie, so everyone pitches in eight or ten euros. What I love about the Grand Boulevard is the fabulous variety of what there is to do here. From the intimacy of the passageways with Le Valentin Tea Room this morning, to the Grand Rex movie theater, and also Drouot, the auction house, where we saw actual works of art being sold before our eyes. And then to wrap up here tonight, the Limonaire in the cozy cabaret singing French songs. Let's see what we can get up to next time.